So I'm walking down an aisle at a flea market. Nice day. I'm looking at the tables, looking on the ground. There's a guy standing at one of the tables, holding this. Yikes! I get a kind of chill all over. I know what it is. It's the first Sony Walkman from 1979. In the box. I'm thinking, this guy's going to buy it for sure. Does he know what it is? Across the table, the seller tells him the price. $25. And then, an amazing thing happens. He puts it down. The guy puts it back down on the table. No, wait. Now he picks it back up again. Then he puts it back down, and he walks away. Well, I waste no time sidling over there to pick it up. I look it over, trying to be nonchalant, trying not to drool. The seller tells me it's twenty dollars. I guess he figured if he couldn't sell it for twenty-five, he'd try twenty. And so I happily gave him the money and brought this home. It is indeed the first Sony Walkman, but the story is a little more complicated and a lot more interesting than just that. Before we open up this box, let's have a look at this interesting story on this website that makes several key points about the Walkman, its place in history, and shows you the rare early versions. What made the Walkman such a game-changing device? Well, more than anything, the Walkman's success was due to the fresh approach it took to something that had been around for a while, something that had never really achieved widespread use before. Headphones. It's all about the headphones. Early radio, around 1920, could be heard only on headphones. That's Junior, Edna, and Pops, listening in while Mom looks on, wondering why this stupid family has radio but still no electric vacuum cleaner. Telegraph operators wore headphones. Later, disc jockeys and airline pilots wore headphones. And in the 1960s, when the technology got good enough, hi-fi buffs discovered headphones. You may have even worn them in the language lab when they were trying to teach you Spanish or French. Other than that, virtually no one used headphones. They were not, in any sense of the word, mainstream. Until the Sony Walkman in 1979. Today, listening to audio with both ears covered, with headphones or earphones, is common. The TPSL2 Sony Walkman is the device that made that common. It changed the way people consume music and other audio. For the first time, high fidelity was mobile. That change in listening habits has proven to be more than a fad as headset use remains common these several decades later. So you see, I think the Walkman is important. And it's all about the headphones. The Walkman was, as we say today, a disruptive technology. Even Sony was uncertain about the potential for its new product. Sony was even unsure of the name Walkman, issuing the TPSL2 without a name at first, with just the word stereo on the front in large letters. The use of this large stereo was not merely a placeholder for a brand name to come. Never before had a portable music player this small been stereo, and, as implied by the word, high fidelity. Sony was the first to realize that users of portable sound devices could care about fidelity. Sony issued this unmarked player in the U.S. as the Soundabout, and in the U.K. as the Stowaway. Testing the Walkman name, a Walking Feet logo was designed with the phrase Walking Stereo with Hotline. It was used on some early vinyl cases and as a sticker on even fewer early Walkmans. Eventually, a new, simpler logo was devised, and the TPSL2 model was branded Walkman internationally. Most were sold in this configuration, and most were sold in the box you see here, that for obvious reasons I call the skate box. 
One interesting rarity sometimes seen on the very earliest Walkman models involves the labeling of the headphone jacks. Nearly all Walkman headphone jacks were labeled A and B, but a few of the very earliest ones were labeled, rather unexpectedly, Guys and Dolls. I don't think I would have believed this if I hadn't seen it. The Guys and Dolls Walkman I've seen came in this box, the Walking Feet box, which I believe was sold originally in Japan. There are two separate instruction booklets inside the Walking Feet box, a 16-pager in Japanese with illustrations, and an accompanying six-page fold-out with an English translation and no pictures. The importance of the lightweight MDR3L2 headphones that came with the TPSL2 Walkman cannot be overstated. If the Walkman was to be successful, it couldn't come with the bulky, heavy headphones that were then the state of the art. Sony's new headphones were high fidelity, yet weighed about one-fifth of typical hi-fi headphones at the time. They were crucial to the Walkman's success, enabling two of the chief components of that success, mobility and the creation of personal space. What is meant by the creation of personal space is that the wearing of headphones in public tells those around you that you are disengaged, that you are in your own space, so to speak. And so, wearing headphones, one could be oblivious of the hubbub surrounding them and indeed ignore it. But that's not fair, some would argue at the time. It's rude. If we have to engage, so should you. Sony was aware that there might be some, shall we say, social pushback to the idea of wearing headphones in public. That's one of the reasons behind the dual headphone jacks for sharing, and for the hotline button that mutes the sound somewhat and activates the Walkman's built-in microphone for hearing ambient sound. But Sony's real answer for those peeved at or jealous of their fellow citizens having a good time listening to their own sounds on headphones was as simple as it was profitable. Get your own Walkman. So let's open up my flea market find and see what's inside. First, we have paperwork. Of course, with every new product comes the dilemma. Get your hands on the product like you want to, or read the instructions first, like you should. <sighs> well, it appears the Walkman comes from the factory inside of its case, and wrapped in a plastic bag. In the boxes that some of the earliest Walkmans came in, the player and the case were packed separately. You can see this here in the Walking Feet box, and also in the Soundabout box. But here in the box in which most Walkmans were sold, the player was shipped inside its case. Let's set that down for a moment and get into the box here. Included from the factory are a pair of batteries. These are alkaline batteries and they're branded Sony EverReady. Huh. Some kind of deal with the EverReady people, I guess. Sony was already in the battery business, had been since the 1950s, Yet somehow they issued these batteries co-branded with EverReady. We see the headphones are wrapped separately, still wrapped in their original factory wrapper. If you look closely, you can see a few crumbling remains of the pads, black crumbles from black pads. I'm not taking the headphones out because I want to keep everything wrapped just the way it was. Now here, I can take this out, it shouldn't hurt to remove this. It's a strap, and this is a pouch for carrying a cassette tape, I suppose. We may learn more about these things in the paperwork. Let's get into it. There's all kinds of paperwork in this bag. Here's a little booklet called The Communicators, Sony Office Products. This shows a bunch of Sony office equipment. I can guess why this is here with the Walkman. A predecessor of the Walkman was the Sony TCM600 Pressman. You can see one of those here on the left, in silver, next to a couple of Walkmans. Or is it Walkmen? 
The press man was a mono recorder and player and could be used for dictation. And so it was an office kind of product. So somehow I guess they thought it was worthwhile putting this office products brochure in here. And here is a free tape offer, which was mentioned on the box, you may recall, so you can send for a free tape. What's offered here is a free blank tape. Buy five Sony blank cassette tapes and they'll send you one free. Or buy ten and they'll send you three free ones. What is a Walkman buyer going to do with blank tapes? The Walkman can't record. This little flyer says it is, quote, packed with your new tape recorder. So I think the company was still a little confused about just what the Walkman was. And here is the warranty, the limited warranty. Have a close look at this. Notice that on the top of the warranty it says audio tape recorder. So again, the Walkman is being referred to as a recorder. There seems to be some confusion about just what they were selling. Sony likely sourced some of this paperwork from the tape recorder division and neglected to change the wording. And here is valuable information for getting Sony International Warranty Service. The IWS, those letters, and GLOBE appear on the box too. IWS stands for International Warranty System. This is a list of Sony service centers around the world. And here's some business reply mail to the Sony Distribution Center free tape offer. This apparently is how you send for your free tape. And here is business reply mail to Sony Corporation of America, Long Island City, New York. And it is an empty envelope. No, wait. It unfolds out to be a questionnaire. Where did you learn about the Walkman? What did you like about it? What's your occupation? All kinds of questions. So it's your warranty registration card, that's what it is, called a customer's inquiry card. And they're using it to collect a little data on you and do a bit of market research. Nowadays, of course, corporations have a voracious appetite for data and constantly try to bribe and cajole consumers into filling out surveys and doing their market research for them. For free, of course. Now, here's a little flyer touting the virtues of Sony's blank tapes. Sony cassette tapes, full color sound. This shows the extensive range of Sony's offerings of cassette tapes. There were six different grades, including regular ferric oxide tapes, a chrome tape, and a metal tape. This brings up something else about the Walkman. Something about the timing of the product's release. Many of us in the 60s didn't think much of cassette tapes. We didn't think they sounded very good. Because they didn't. With the audio tape technology at the time, Tape could reproduce high fidelity at a tape speed of 7.5 inches per second, like on a big tape deck that used reels of tape. And decent fidelity could be had at a speed of 3 and 3 quarters inches per second, if you wanted to save money on tape. And that's how fast 8-tracks ran, 3 and 3 quarters inches per second. But cassettes, the tapes this Walkman used, ran at half that speed, a mere one and seven eighths inches per second, with four tiny little tracks on a one eighth inch wide tape. And so many of us back in the 1960s had dismissed the cassette tape as a format for music. But all through the 1970s, while we weren't looking, tape technology advanced significantly. And so for some of us, it came as quite a surprise how good the Sony Walkman sounded when it appeared in 1979. A lot of that surprise was about the tape. And here is the Walkman, unboxed and unbagged, but brand new. And in a minute, we'll look it over uncased. These are hard to find in any condition, and when they are found, it is usually without the case. So you might find one like that, without the case, and notice curious discolorations on the silver panel on the right side of the front. What causes that are these snaps on the case. 
The underside of these snaps touches the Walkman and causes this discoloration. So to find one of these in new condition without any of this discoloration is a real treat. I'm kind of surprised the front panel here isn't discolored just from sitting all these years inside this case, inside this box. The aluminum cabinet has a battery door on the back. Not being plastic, it can't just snap on with little tabs, but instead has a little mechanical latching mechanism. Inside the battery compartment is the serial number. Here, where the cassette tape goes, there's this piece of paper that refers to a little spacer that's here to keep things stable in shipping. It says, roughly translated, pitch that thing out. I like the way the illustration shows you what to do. Thwack it, it says, more or less. Thwack this thing out of there. It's like Ikea instructions, only these I understand. Before attempting to use the Walkman, you're going to need to thwack this thing out. And, of course, this Walkman has never been thwacked. There's just a single owner's manual here, but it is in eight different languages, listed here on the front. The English language section is the first nine pages of this 56-page booklet. Here's a list of illustrations on the inside front cover. Inside the back cover, we see the parts and controls identified with numbers and letters that correspond to references made in the text. And here's how to use the carrying case, along with that pouch that will apparently hold a couple of cassette tapes. On the contents page, it says, The Walkman Portable Cassette Player lets you enjoy true hi-fi stereo sound anytime, anywhere. Its exclusive hotline function lets you talk to anyone listening with you through headphones. Aha! Uh -huh. Next are some precautions, such as not leaving the Walkman on a radiator or in front of an oncoming train. Things like that. And here's some detail on the batteries. We're going to keep moving along, but if you want to read all this, feel free to pause the video. I won't stop you. The next page talks about inserting and playing tapes, and then we get to the details about listening with another person and the hotline function. Then the location of controls and what they all do. On the next page, we learn about using the Walkman with optional power sources, external adapters for using it with AC power, and another adapter for plugging the Walkman into a cigarette lighter. And there's a rechargeable battery pack offered. And we get some maintenance tips. Then we get to the specifications page with all the technical data. And here is a list of the optional accessories, at the top of which is the MDR3L2 headphones, so you can get an extra pair and share your Walkman with a friend. Back on that website, we see a couple of amusing knockoff versions of the Walkman. It was widely copied, as you might imagine, by people better at copying than innovating. Quoting from the website, the Kisho MC-101 cassette player knockoff is from Hong Kong. It is a shameless piece of junk, and like the Windsor below, it borrows Sony's hotline button. One of the more amusing tributes is the Windsor ST-1400 walking-talking hotline stereo AM-FM radio, made in Hong Kong 1982. This Windsor even rips off the Sony skate box in a wonderfully pathetic imitation. End quote. Yeah, I love this knockoff box especially. In every single way, its imitation of the Sony box is absolutely pathetic. Yes, that's the word for it. As a collector, I like to collect the first of things. Some of the firsts I've managed to find are these, an example of the first transistor TV, the Philco Safari from 1959. And here's Apple's first laptop computer from 1989. It weighs over 16 pounds, and its cost new was $6,500. But what I collect most are transistor radios, and I was lucky enough to find an example of the world's first one of those, this one, from 1954, the Regency TR1, made in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
Even harder to find was this first, the first transistor radio made in Japan. It's the green one here on the left, and it's the Sony TR55, made in 1955. Yes, Sony was no stranger to innovation. You may be interested to know that Sony's company name wasn't even Sony when these early Sony radios were made. The company's name was Tokyo Shushun Kogyo. They made up the word Sony to use on their first transistor radio. And so this is the first product ever to bear the Sony brand name. Here's what the first Sony logo looked like. They used this logo until 1958, the year they changed over to this logo, and changed the company name itself to Sony. What do the transistor radio and the Walkman have in common? I'm talking here about these devices' impact on society. In what way did these inventions change the way we live? Personal listening. The concept of listening to audio alone was pretty much invented with the transistor radio. Before that, most people didn't listen to audio in isolation. You listened to audio out loud, usually in some kind of a group, at a concert, at church, in the parlor, listening to your sister play the piano, in the living room around the radio or phonograph. The Walkman took the transistor radio's personal audio concept a couple of steps further. First, by being a headphone-only device, the Walkman couldn't be played out loud at all. And second, because it played pre-recorded tapes, which the listener chose, the listening experience was not subject to choices made at a radio station, but was more personal than ever. Now I'll wrap this up with a question. There have been three major devices for listening to audio that each in its own way, in turn, revolutionized the listening experience and made it personal. The transistor radio in 1954 was first. The Walkman in 1979 was the second. What was the third? <laughs>